Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Sunday talk within the nine sided circle. I am one of your hosts who you're actually going to be learning a little bit more about tonight, Nora Kyle. And I am with. the other one of your hosts, which you're going to learn nothing about tonight, Mushtaq Ali. <laughs> who knows, though? Maybe I'll spill a secret or two in the process. You might. At least they'll learn if I have any decent interviewing skills. Mm, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. And then you'll get your tune soon enough. Yeah. Turnabout is fair play. So do we have any announcements? Yes. We have Can announcements. Um, like us on Facebook. Like us on YouTube. Ah, uh, the spiel. Yeah, yes. the spiel. All right. Here we go. Spieling. Folks. We're really happy to have you. Uh, we've been doing this now for a little over two years, believe it or not. I looked it up today and it was like, OMG. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we provide this to you for free because we think that this kind of stuff should mostly be free. And Our Sunday try, talks and such, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, try, we try and give you... Um, you know, really good content, not just fluff, not just advertisements, uh, but stuff that it actually has some teeth to it. And we do this because we think the world needs it. Mm. We also do this because it keeps us off the streets. Out of trouble. Yes. 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 So we would like you to please consider, if you have not done this already, look down below, it would probably be down there in the description and you will see a bunch of links and look over here and where is it over here? It's over in one of these places. You will see a little subscribe button. If you're watching us on YouTube, do consider subscribing to us. You will get notification, especially if you hit the notify button of when we put up new videos, all of which are new, exciting, improved. <laughs> As we go, we're certainly improving, yes. yes. I could say that much. And we're also running a retreat right now that is Starting pretty much- this third week. Yeah, yeah. So for those of you who are already participating, we just want to remind you that we unfortunately got our dates wrong in the packet, but to correct that, I want to let you know that our next group session is Saturday, September 17th at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And then the third one, the fourth one actually, is going to be October 24th, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. The fifth one, the final one, unless we agree as a group to change the date, is going to be November 1st at 4 p.m. That's a Sunday and it's going to be Pacific Standard Time because that's the day that we change back to Standard Time. Yes, All Souls Day or Dia de los Muertos. Yes, so a fun that's important. We want to make sure everybody catches that. And for all of you, we run this whole show right now. We're trying to see if we can get away with doing this mostly through donations. Mm -hmm. you look down below, you will find a donation link. For instance, we didn't charge anybody to join our retreat, even though you're getting huge and amazing, wonderful <laughs> things of value beyond the price of pearls. Emeralds cost less than the value that you're getting in this retreat, and you get to do it for whatever you can afford. If you can afford nothing, then that's what you pay. If you can afford a few dollars, then you can donate oh. that. It is alms to the poor, the poor being Noor and I, because right now uh, life is hard out here. So if you want to donate, there's a donation link down there and that will keep us going and we will keep bringing you wonderful content and profound thoughts and uh, the occasional lame ass joke. <laughs> and for those who have already participated, whether you do it once off or you do that regularly, it means a lot to us and it helps us continue the work that we do. So thank you so much for that. And even more important than that, give us some feedback down below. Yes. Make a comment. 
what did you think of this? What would you like to see different? What would you like to see the same? Tell us if you liked it. Tell us if you hate it. As long as you're polite, the comment will be published. If you're a dick, it'll never see the light of day. Mm. But, Ask good questions, too. Yes. We welcome questions. So there we are. I have, I have done the spiel. Excellent. Good work. Very thorough. So are we ready? Yeah, I think we're ready. And yes. I'm going to go and I'm actually going to pin your video. So you are being seen the whole time. The whole time? You are the sound of my voice, but we want to see you. Okay. Okay, so let me tell, let me give you a little bit of background, which is a few days ago, I realized that just over two years ago, it was July two years ago, Mm -hmm. uh, we started doing this and we just jumped in and it's like, here are these two weird people and they're just talking. I have no idea who they are. Do you know who these people are? No, I don't know who these people are. Do you know who they are? No. Uh, and so I decided with malice of forethought that you should find out who we are. It should you want to know. If you don't mm -hmm. want to know, you can stop the video here and go off and do important things. But if you'd like to know, this is where you find out exactly who Noor Kyle is. Where did she come from? What is all of these things about her? Where is she going? Why is she the most important person in the nine-sided circle? People don't realize this. People think, oh, it must be Mushtaq because he's male and he talks a lot. But no, this is not true. She yeah. just keeps me on a leash and lets me loose <laughs> every now and again. But she is actually the leader of the group. You didn't know that, did you? No did pressure. I know that even? Just kidding. Yeah. No, no pressure. <laughs> so now tell us, Noor, where are yeah. you from? Where were you born? So I grew, born? when was I born? Yeah. yeah. Because people look at her and they think, God, she's what, 16? And this is Spilling actually the not the case. Yeah. Spilling the secrets of my youth. Um, yeah, so I was born in 1987 in Boston, Massachusetts to my parents. <laughs> One hopes. One hopes. Um, and I spent most of my childhood in southeastern Massachusetts. Didn't really travel outside of that, except maybe to New York. So it was, you know, pretty local. I grew up in a pretty um, somewhat homogenous environment. And my parents were uh, my grim. My mom's side was Episcopalian, if you want to talk about like family culture, and my dad's side was Catholic. My mom became kind of a born again Christian in her 20s, so I was raised more Protestant than anything else. And that was kind of the beginning of the, I'd say, outsidership in my family culture. Because of course you go to family events and stuff like that and they're talking about Catholic holidays and ritual and that was just totally not something I was exposed to as a kid. Now, what's the most interesting thing about your mother other than she's incredibly sweet? I know her mother, <laughs> she is incredibly sweet. I love my mom a lot. Um, I find I have a hard time expressing that verbally but we are a very physically affectionate family. And one thing that has deeply affected the way I grew up is that both of my parents have certain health issues. But for my mom, she also has a disability, which is she's deaf in one ear and pretty severely hard of hearing in the other. And while we didn't learn sign language, we did a lot of communicating non-verbally. So I've said this, in my life, probably a lot more than I've said, I love you. Now, would you like to tell us why your mother is deaf? 
my mother is deaf because uh, she has a genetic disorder, which I share with her, um, called Stickler syndrome. And it's got a fancy medical name, but basically what the name in Latin says is that it affects the eyes, the ears, the physical structure of bones and tissues and things like that. So all of those parts of our body are affected by this genetic disorder. And for my mom, uh, it severely affected her hearing. And for myself, it severely affected my vision primarily, but I also have a bit of hearing loss myself. And we both suffer from early onset arthritis. We found out that we had this condition when I was uh, tested for the genetic mutation for the condition when I was 14. And because it tends to pass through families, it was pretty safe to assume my mother had it as well. My brother is not impacted. It's a 50-50. So how did this impact you? <sighs> it, um, I was in a lot of pain in uh, my early teens, and we had no idea why. I was experiencing a lot of pain in my back and in my knees for the most part, which had me sitting out of gym class and just wondering what was wrong with me. Um, I had had back pains when I was really young and we know now that I have a degenerating disc in my mid lower back, which I think explains why I was having those inexplicable pains when I was really young. Um, when I was 14 and I was diagnosed I was already kind of prone to feeling insecure and depressed at that time, but it certainly sent it to the next level. I felt pretty sorry for myself and felt even more um, alienated from my peers, let's say. Yeah. And of course, we haven't mentioned the other things that sticklers gave you, which is looking really, really young. Yep. Uh, oh, height wise, both height. my mom and I are short. I'm actually an inch shorter than my mom. I'm a four eight and she, I don't know about now, now that she's postmenopausal and such, but she was four nine. Um, she was always bigger than you and could push you around. <laughs> yeah, she's a bit stockier than I am. So I'm overall a little bit tinier. So all of these things, constant pain, tiny, uh, feeling insecure. How did this inform your spiritual journey? Well, um, it led me to an interesting change of events when I was 16. Do tell. So <laughs> after I was diagnosed and all of the results were in and all the tests had been done, my uh, pediatric, uh, I'm not sure what his position was, but I think he was in the field of genetics and rheumatology and things like that. He was like, I'm sending you to a camp for kids with arthritis. And at first I was like, ew, what? But honestly, uh, the summer of my 16th birthday, um, it was August, I got hauled off to camp by my mom and it was a life-changing experience. I realized I needed to get out of my own head. I needed to relate to other kids who were having the same experience I was. And I was also lucky enough to meet my first love there. I ended up crushing on a girl and the feeling was mutual. So 
that fall kind of changed my whole life up to that point. And I had been struggling spiritually in that I felt like I couldn't relate to the Christian idea of God being kind of a embodied entity. And I also felt like I wasn't really listened to. So at that time, I was just like, I'm going to take the plunge into weirdness <laughs> and I'm going to embrace this new relationship and this new way of seeing the world that is less tied to other people's um, assumptions about what a good life is. So in a sense, I became a militant atheist. At the same time, however, I was more open-minded than I had ever been. That's interesting. From militant atheist to Sufi teacher. Yeah. That's, that's got to be a bit of a trip there. So let's take a look at that. How did you really begin to put your feet on what has become your spiritual path? Oh, so by the time of my late 20s, I had noticed that I did not necessarily miss religion itself, but that I was feeling spiritual longings, let's say. But I didn't really know where to place that. And at the time I was having, I was experiencing a lot of exposure to Islam socially. I had dated a guy who was Muslim and we didn't really talk about religion much, but I was interested because it was definitely a part of his culture, his, you know, his home life and his worldview. So I was very curious about exploring that so that I could understand him better. But I also had a best friend who was Egyptian American. Um, she wore a headscarf and I spent a lot of time with her family and I loved them a lot. And in spite of all this, you know, I, I was still involved with this girl and I just felt like there has to be a place for everything I'm feeling somehow in the mix of all this. And it wasn't until I reached um, college that I was able to engage academically with uh, spirituality. And I was doing a paper on ethics and what my topic was, was religious pluralism. And through that, I was exposed to Sufism for the first time. Don't I was, uh, yeah, I was doing research. It was, it was just me looking for things that were going to allow me to write about religion in such a way that it wasn't about exclusivity, being right or wrong, but about, I guess, what I was kind of fixating on was a sense of panentheism, which is like the universe is God, everything that exists is God. And that was the thread between my schoolwork and myself that was getting tugged out of it. Okay, so that covers the in intellectual part of the path. Yeah. <laughs> when did it start getting real? Okay, so one night I was reading, you know, it's funny how these things get triggered. I was reading something about Sufism and I felt it touching my heart in such a way that I was instantly overwhelmed. And I think it was, I tripped upon the Hadith about Hadith Qudsi, you know, I was a hidden treasure and I wanted to be known. And that was like a stab to the heart. And I immediately found myself tearing up and having a visual 
experience, I guess we could say, of a kind of kaleidoscopic effect happening for me. And I had the sense that, not that I was a sinner or anything like that, but that I had been ignorant. And my feeling was I had failed to see the sacredness of everything that was in front of me. And I felt extremely humbled by that. And also a little terrified. It was kind of like, wow, holy shit, I, I guess this, this atheism thing isn't really cutting it. Um, and I just found myself on the floor sobbing. And then? And then I had a few years of trying to figure out what all this meant for me, but it had definitely shifted my life in a humongous way. And- uh, Is that the point where you became a Muslim? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> but that did eventually happen, yes. Um, so when I was, uh, a couple years further into college, I was studying comparative religion and I had a Sufi, a professor who was teaching us Sufism, but who I began to realize was a practicing Sufi himself. And in the midst of all this, I was feeling like I, I called it kind of my second coming out because I found that I was falling in love with Islam and Sufism in a way that I was almost embarrassed about. <laughs> but that I couldn't resist. It, it had a real pull for me that went so deep that I had to put whatever trepidations I had aside about how my family would deal with it, what it would mean for me in terms of whether other Muslims would accept me, all of that stuff just seemed to not matter. And it was really about my relationship with the divine and the unveiling of who and what that might be to me. Um, through that teacher, I connected with a Sufi teacher. And upon meeting him in person, um, I realized this is, this is the direction I'm heading in. I'm heading towards Sufism for sure. So I eventually took initiation with that teacher. And I am officially a member of the Kadri Rufai Tariqa. That happened in 2011, I believe. But then you had some, uh, some detours. Some detours, so. Do we wanna talk about the whole hijabi thing and everything? Yeah, sure. Um, so I wore a headscarf for three and a half years. I think when I was in college, I felt frustrated because I was at a giant university at one point. I was in a sorority with a gaggle of South Asian women who I became super close friends with. And that relationship kind of set me up for being, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute you, um, Shuri. Actually, I can't, I'm not a- uh, Oh, good God. What's wrong with me? Where are you? Oh, here you are. Voila, I forgot all about that. I was so excited to interview you. <laughs> now you have the power. Yay, all right. So yeah, I mean, anyone can chat with me, ask me questions, but I just wanna make sure that I can focus since as I mentioned previously, I do deal with a bit of shyness and social anxiety. So I gotta look out for myself. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of had this sense that I had become okay with being the odd one out in the space that I was in. 
And by the time I moved on to my next school, I transferred from a giant university, UMass Amherst, to a tiny Catholic college called Stonehill College. In the serious lack of diversity there became quite a problem for me. I felt like when people talked about Islam, they were talking about the other. They were not talking about people who could be sitting in the room with them. And so I kind of used hijab as a political tool and as a social tool to say there are people among us who are not exactly the same as us and who are looking at the world in very different ways. And I found that it was challenging in a lot of ways in that um, I think there was only like two other girls wearing headscarves on campus. <laughs> and I was definitely the only white girl and wearing hijab. Um, it made me very visible. And I also found it made me very visible, not only on campus, but in public life. Um, but as I progressed during those four and a half years, I realized that it was becoming less of a politically driven choice and more of a psychological trap. And in the last six months of my wearing hijab, I actually had to unwind um, different issues I had around modesty and my body and relationships with men. So I think while I learned a lot from that experience, it's not something that I feel is beneficial for me to continue in the long term. Yeah. And yeah. so back to the detour. The detour. The detour. Um, hmm. Trying to figure out which aspects of the detour you're thinking about. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about when you got sucked into that one cult-like group. Oh, okay. So... I didn't necessarily get sucked into it as a member, but I had some friendships with people who were part of a certain community in Southern California. And at the time I had just moved to California, to LA, I was deliberately moving to make more friends um, in the Sufi community, my own age, and who were spiritually inclined I wanted to hang out with more Muslims. I was hoping to be more immersed in that, I guess. And at the same time, I did not want to sacrifice my independent thinking and all that. And so that was a tough balance because I found myself in this community where it was different from the community that I had become initiated into. They were much more conservative. There was a lot more of a sense of deference to leadership, to abstaining from popular media because it was considered like a tool of shaitan and a way for evil to kind of get into you. I mean, it was, it was a bit much for me. It was a bit too woo, as they say. Um, and I saw that there was a lot of pressure within the group to conform to the idea of what a good Sufi or a good Muslim was. That wasn't for me, but I was so hungry for companionship socially and spiritually that I got a little lost in it. And I considered taking initiation with them as well. But when I checked back with my teacher back East, he 
shared some thoughts about how manipulative a community that was. And I knew he was telling the truth. So I had to take that as my foundation for uh, separating myself from that community. Yep, because poaching students is something that they were prone to do. And while I didn't necessarily feel that was happening to me, uh, I could see it was definitely kind of a proselytizing, manipulative environment, like I said, yeah. And that gets us to the interesting part of your story. The whole story is interesting, but the interesting part to me was, it was somewhere around in there that you and I started working together. Yeah, so Mushtaq and that? I- How the hell did that even happen? Okay, so early on in my initiation to um, QRT, I did like a Facebook adding of everyone in the group where people were adding me back and things like that. And Mushtaq happened to be among those people because he is also a member of QRT, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that next week. <laughs> yeah. So um, we Just both we don't share. Want to focus on me. We want to focus on you. All right. Sure. Um, so we share a sheikh, meaning we share a spiritual teacher. We're part of the same lineage. And um, I just found that, you know, everyone else was kind of living this fluffy, yay nature, yay God, kind of overly saccharine kind of approach to Islam or to Sufism. But uh, with you, Mushtaq, I found it kind of intriguing that you were talking about archery and knife making and lots of more visceral primal stuff like I really wanted that to be part of what I was learning and how I was growing and we became friends I think in like 2013 Something yeah, like 2012 that. 2013, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yep. And we didn't talk too much at first, but I did feel like you were easy to talk to, that you were never one to talk down to me, that you gave great advice, <laughs> that you always posted interesting things that made you seem like someone who knew how to think deeply and feel deeply. And I did not necessarily hit it off on a more intimate level with my sheikh. That can happen sometimes, like you belong with the community, but you don't necessarily find the teacher-student relationship you're looking for. And I appreciate Sheikh for what he has given me since I took initiation with him. And I will always be grateful for that. But when Mushtaq and I connected, um, something in me knew this is, this is my teacher. And I don't think he expected that. <laughs> no, I was retired. <laughs> yeah. Minding my own business back there, back east, just hanging out with yep. the birds and the chipmunks. Javelining. Yeah. Stuff in the backyard. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, shooting arrows, stabbing people with swords, minding my own business. <laughs> yeah. I don't um, do any of this stuff anymore. <laughs> I was tired of it after decades. And he he kind of, you know, wasn't offering or anything like that. Uh, I think one way that I initiated it was I asked him to teach me about magic, weirdly enough. That is not necessarily Mushtaq's jam. 
but I just felt like he knows something I don't. I want to know what it is. And that was my starting point because I, I wasn't at that point super sure about Sufism as my continuing path. Um, but then I tricked you into doing practices. Yeah, he did. Um, at that point, I mean, at that time, I was I was pretty lost in my own stuff, let's say. I was unable to really recognize the things that I had to be grateful for in my life. I was suffering for money. I mean, in a sense that I was having a hard time making ends meet in a very serious pointed way. And I was so stuck like that. I didn't really know what to do about it. Um, I was just getting into therapy with an amazing therapist who I have since parted ways with because we've realized that we've grown together and I've flown the nest. But at that time, we were just beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you graduated. Yep. Yes, I did. Yes. And I think she would agree too. Yep. Um, I needed support at that time. And the practices that Mushtaq gave me to take up, should I choose to do so, really helped me get out of the rut that I was in. Yep. I mean, I remember doing the gratitude practice for the first time where you were like, okay, I want you to do this breathing exercise and I want you to write a whole bunch of stuff you feel grateful for. And I was like irritated by it. And yet once <laughs> I had done it, yeah, it's true. I was like, ew, angry even. Why am I, why do I have to do this? This is stupid. There's nothing to be grateful for. Obviously I was wrong. And as most of us know here, it's really a matter of how we frame things and what we choose to give witness to. So I learned my lesson that way. <laughs> and then after a few years of practice, you graduated. Yeah. So, I mean, once I persuaded Mushtaq to <laughs> be my teacher, you know, all that stuff took like a year or two, I believe. Um, a couple years after that, I received my blessing to be a teacher in my own right. And that was a very powerful experience as well. Yeah. And why do you think you received that? Um, well, I, I put the work in. That's a big part of it. Putting and the work in is a big part of it, but it's not the biggest part of it. I committed I to it. it. Yes, you did. Yeah. That. And that's still not the biggest part of it. I'm going to make you say it. Um... Well, it feels like my life's work to continue yeah. what we're doing. Let us not forget your awakening experience. Oh, yeah. yeah. That. I understand okay. if you don't want to talk about it too much, but let's just acknowledge that that was the key that uh, unlocked your own entrance into uh, being invited to teach. Well, I'm not sure if we're thinking of the same experience. I hope we are. Um, so I really struggled with uh, making the commitment because commitments are, you know, the word one you're of those looking things. For is anathema. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I own that, but I also know that pushing through that is critical to me growing in my life. So at that time, I was really chewing my nails about uh, whether I was worthy of taking the mantle, as they say. And 
I just, at one point, when I was really in the depth of my panic and worry and doubt and self-judgment and stuff, I, I had this beautiful experience of crumbling inside. But before me, I was witnessing just this expanse on the horizon of my spiritual ancestors. I mean, just all of them kind of waiting for me to join them. And we're talking all kinds of ancestors because part of the tradition that Mushtaq and I share has uh, you know, a shamanic component to it. It's got an academic component to it. It's certainly spiritual. It's certainly historical. And I could just see them all. And it was terrifying, <laughs> but it also felt very real. And at that point, I was convinced that as hard as it was for me to feel ready to make the promise of committing to this work, it was what I really wanted to do. So I did it. Yeah. And that was, I'm, I'm going to talk about you a little bit here, that for you, that was the pivotal point because you went from being asleep and lost in all of your doubts and such to being awake and knowing what you were doing. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. the moment you woke up. Yep. That was also the moment you stopped being my student. Yeah. At that point, I was taking the reins for myself. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then we created the nine-sided circle. Yeah, I think um, six months after that. Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was a huge step forward. So this is the basic story of Noor Kyle, and it is a story. And we all know that. Mm -hmm. And yet it, it gives you a certain sense of her history, how she got here. Now the floor is officially open for questions. You can ask her anything. I invite you to ask me anything. Doesn't mean she'll answer. Doesn't yep. mean she'll answer. She might tell you to stuff it, but you can ask. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to know something about Noor? And they were all quiet. Well, that's okay. You must have, you must have told them everything. Come on, Zainab. Mm -hmm. You got to have a question. Um, it was very nice actually to hear Noor and her journey. Um, I always thought Noor was Muslim from from very background, <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting. It's it's like you already have that in in you, or that Sufi. Um, Hmm. Wow. Thank you, Zainab. Yeah. Okay. Other questions. What do you want to know about Nora's life? Well, one thing I certainly would be interested in is yeah. yeah, what was it about Sufism that caught you? I mean, what was it? That, that really attracted you about Sufism as opposed to the other things that you're exposed to? So at that time where I chose comparative religion as my major, I had done, I had tried on, let's say, a lot of different things. I had tried on economics. I had tried on, what else? Chinese studies, 
I thought about Buddhism, I thought about Hinduism. I didn't really, I had to figure it out the hard way over time. And I just found sometimes it was superficial, like, oh, the music of Sufism is so beautiful. <laughs> Other times it was deeper and it was like, this way of talking and thinking about God resonates for me. And the way Sufism talks about God is such that it's less about the rules or the dogmas and all that stuff and so much more about relationship and about a willingness to some people would say surrender i don't i don't prefer that myself at all which is something that kind of separates me from most muslims um it's like being in love like i said it, it was it was kind of like coming out for a second time because as i mentioned i had been in a relationship with another girl earlier in my life and that taught me a lot of lessons and this felt so similar to that it definitely was like falling in love with what we might call the divine if i, if I heard you correctly what one of the things that inspired you was when you saw that this i, I i'm not sure what the backstory was but you know, it, there was this hidden treasure wanting to be known. And that's yes. like that cut somehow to the core of what maybe at that time you were looking for, you know, and I wonder if you could tell us more about that. Let me I give you the, the, the full hadith in context. Yeah, this, uh, hadith Qutsi. Qutsi. Hadith Qutsi are uh, sayings by God through the prophet Muhammad that do not appear in the Quran and yet were recorded in the time. And the hadith that she refers to is, I was a hidden treasure and I loved to be known. So I created the, the, I created the universe that I might be known. Mm -hmm. That's what got her. Mm -hmm. That gets a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it just, like I, I think I mentioned, it was it was kind of like a wounding or a heartbreak when I read that. Like this is kind of like someone saying, I mean, I think that other people of other faiths have had similar experiences where it's like, you know, I've been longing to see you. I wish you'd just turn to me. So it was the God, whatever, that hidden being revealed rather than something in yourself that you felt had been hidden that needed to come out. Right. So, yeah. I, I think, of course, you know, parts of myself have emerged through this process, but it wasn't about me trying to find. I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you don't mean it like this, but it wasn't like me trying to find a hat that fit. Mm -hmm. It was deeper than that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. All right. More questions. Nancy, <laughs> give us a question um, if you have one. Uh, a couple. Um, well, I was going to ask you what you liked about Islam, but I, I may have an answer there. Yeah. How would you answer that? Excuse me? How would you answer that? I'm just curious. I mean, like, how do you receive that? Because you may be right. And, and if not, I'd love to elaborate. So, well, it, it seemed like, um, damn, it is getting away from me. So maybe <laughs> you could elaborate. Uh, but sure. About, you know, an attitude about God that suited you. Uh, I mean, I am always a little bit dodgy about the word God. I find it's a good placeholder. It's not necessarily the word that I 
I mean, there's no word that I prefer to be perfectly honest with you. It's just the one that works. Um, the divine, the sacred, all <laughs> the one, all of those work. Um, what drew me to Islam was this sense that uh, not only is God closer to you than your jugular vein, as they say in Islam, but God is also inexplicable. It is not, you know, I hate using this and I, I don't mean to use it in a pejorative way, but I wasn't looking for a sky daddy, to be frank. And I found that Islam offered me a conceptualization of God that felt more quote unquote true for me intellectually and spiritually. I think spiritually Sufism is my home, but if we wanna talk about like mainstream religions and things like that, Islam gave me a place to live. Can you expand on what made it such a good fit? Um, that requires me to look back quite a bit. Um, well, I think the Quran can be received in a lot of different ways, but when I read it, I felt like it was a poem. Bye, Zainab. She took off already. My bad. I'm glad she said goodbye, though. Um, I felt like it was a poem. I felt at times that it was a love letter to humanity or kind of a way of saying, you know, why are you doing this to yourselves? It's making me sad, which <laughs> doesn't really get to the heart of it, but I, uh, I think it's a start in terms of trying to pull up a lot of those experience I had at a time that is, you know, almost a decade from me now. Um, I felt like the rituals of prayer really helped one embody a sense of engagement with the universe because I felt that it was kind of like a a way of acknowledging our tininess in the midst of it all. You're doing a lot of bowing down. There's a lot of touching the earth. That was very powerful to me. So I hope that begins to give a better fleshed out idea about what might have drawn me to Islam. But it certainly wasn't, um, you know, a lot of the stuff we see in mainstream media about gender roles and um, rigidities and things like that. I personally don't believe those are what Islam was meant to be, but unfortunately we have authorities in place who are shaping Islam as it's practiced today to suit their interests. I just feel like that's something I don't really have an interest in sharing in. Yeah, well, I, I take Mushtaq's thing about how Religions use, lose their original impetus very quickly. I, I, I believe that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And for a less central question, you've mentioned that you sing and you teach singing. I was wondering if you've got any other things that you do. For hobbies and such like that? Yeah. 
Um, I think I mentioned that I play Animal Crossing. That's kind of my guilty pleasure right now. <laughs> Since I can't eat sweets and I try to not sit in front of Netflix all the time until like designated evening time for TV and such. Um, I am a writer. I mean, I don't do a lot of writing, but I consider it one of my foundational talents. I've written poetry in the past. Let's um, not forget also that you are a top-notch editor. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind you, of, yeah. You have uh, editing a new translation of the Quran under your belt. I, that, so, yes. Yeah, you don't talk about that. <laughs> I'm gonna make you talk about that. All right. Um, so a few years ago, a professor from my alma mater approached me and said, I would love to have you, if you're interested, join our Quran project. I would love for you to be an editor. You only have to do as much as you're comfortable with, but I think you would be a good um, addition to the team. And I took him up on it. And uh, that was like a three-year project, wasn't it? Huge. I mean, I had to go over this thing three times. <laughs> the whole thing, just bit by bit by bit. And there were always changes being made that I had to go back and incorporate into text I had already edited. And of course, I my Arabic is, is nothing to speak of. So I wasn't necessarily doing the translating, but I was doing the shaping of the words, nonetheless, the shaping of the uh, translated version, making sure that it read well, that it spoke to the reader, that its message was getting across clearly. Uh, I'm proud to say that I am one of the main people who helped make that happen. Yep. And my name will be in that book. So that's exciting too. So yes, she's a writer. She's an editor. What else are you? <laughs> um, Telling that you come up first with, oh, I play Animal Crossing. Well, it goes to show that I am not used to putting myself in the spotlight in this space. Um, what else do I do? I, I love offbeat fashion. I don't do a lot of dressing up these days in the midst of the pandemic and such, but I want to show off my sweater today. It's got like stars and stuff on it. It's very cute. Um, I love makeup, not great at hair, but I do my best and I just very much enjoy I think hijab played into this. I enjoy pushing the boundaries of what people around me might find acceptable or, you know, I, I just like pushing boundaries a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I drew the line when she started dressing in kitchen utensils. <laughs> I just think of Lady Gaga's meat dress. Like that's a little outside my purview, but I find her very inspirational, yeah. Mustakim, do you have any questions? Y'all definitely take the opportunity now because she's never gonna let me do this again. Mm, oh, I don't know. I like when people initiate conversations with me, so that's always nice. Um, Mr. King says, how do you think about Sufism and what in Sufism helps you keep going after all these years? Well, I mean, I definitely have my ups and downs spiritually. I'm not always feeling like the world is thrillingly beautiful and exciting, but I think what keeps me grounded is kind of not dependent on me finding the world beautiful and shiny. shiny. Um, 
my job as I see it is to wake up every day. I mean, you know, literally and figuratively speaking and to help others do the same. And sometimes that means faking it till I make it. Sometimes that means sitting and meditating and making sure that I'm in a state where I'm not going to be putting my heavy load on another person, let's say. Other times I'm ecstatic and I'm just like skipping around and thinking I want to tell the whole world that I love it and that I love every person. And it's, it's funny how we can swing back and forth in that way. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm basically married to Sufism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I made that commitment and it makes me feel good to keep it. I am a spiritual teacher in the Sufi tradition and that is something that I can't shake off. It's stuck to me now. I used super glue. Yep. I have a commitment to my ancestors to keep and to those who will come after me. Cherie, any questions before we wrap this up? You must have a good one. <laughs> I just, it was, I'm sorry I came in late, but um, it kind of reminds me of the actor's studio where they ask, you know, so what's your favorite curse word? <laughs> <laughs> what is my favorite curse word? We um, learned that last night, didn't we? Oh, uh, what was it again? Fuck no. socks. Fuck socks. Oh, man. No, mine is... I mean, it's definitely fuck, but like, fuck what? I don't know. It's a great word. It's a very versatile word. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Anything um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Fuck. Shit. Yeah. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Are spiritual teachers allowed to say shit and fuck? I First time I heard Sheikh say some stuff, I was like clutching my pearls a little. And then I realized this is this is why this guy's my dude, you know? Like he didn't end up becoming my primary teacher, but I knew this is a place I can breathe, you know. Um He gets all the rowdy ones. Yeah. Yeah. The rabble rousers. Yep. Oh, great. So what, what's um, something that you were asked to do that just totally outraged you, but gave you the best growth in that moment? Uh, um, it was more feedback rather than a directive, which was I had just broken up with someone and I was, oh, I mean, I don't mind sharing this because I feel like it's educational for everybody. Um, you know, we were friends and I was thinking it would be fine if we hooked up one last time. And in that thinking, I was thinking in such a way that I was objectifying him. I wasn't seeing him as a being who would be impacted by that choice. Uh, because I had arranged it so that we were easing into an intimate relationship because I thought it was going to go deeper. I thought that this is going to be a long-term thing and we ended up breaking up before that happened. So after we broke up, I was like, all right, we can have sex now. And it's like, no harm, no foul. But as a Sufi, I had to understand that I have a higher responsibility than that. I can't just be like, I'm going to get my kicks. We'll have sex and that'll be it. Like, no, that would leave some kind of emotional impression on me because I was definitely still attached to him, even if I might have been able to disengage from that temporarily. And likewise for him, who knows how that might have affected him. That wasn't something he was seeking. It was something that I would have been initiating. And 
uh, I got called out on that. And I was angry about it. I, I did not want to be told that I was treating someone like an object. It, it wasn't necessarily about the sex. It was about the objectification, not considering that this other person involved is a full-fledged human being. And likewise, myself, I was objectifying myself too by not acknowledging that I was feeling sensitive and vulnerable. I was furious about that. Really? And I, I really chewed myself up about it. Not only was I angry, but I also felt ashamed. Mm. And I was also thinking, why am I being deprived of sex? It's no big deal. And no one's depriving me of it. You know, no one was telling me what to do. It was more like, you can make a choice here. So who was the person who actually called you out? Uh, Mushtaq, actually. Okay, yes. yeah. that's good. And the best friends I find are the ones who will be courageous enough to say, hey, and they can do it in such a way that might not be right in your face, but they, they do it out of love. And I think that's where this lesson is so powerful that when people call you out, are they doing it out of love or are they trying to manipulate you or are they coercing you or are you awake enough to notice that this is the blessing and and I really value those friendships the most yeah. because this was it's not all that kind. human. Pardon? I said this was not all that kind. He no. was pretty stern and angry with me about yeah. it. Yeah, but you know what? She has never looked upon another human being as a thing since then. Mm -hmm. yep. That was pivotal for her. It was. Mm. She now, and I can say this with full confidence, she's, she sees people as subject. And she would never use somebody like that ever again. She grew up. Mm. Yep. I agree. 100%. It was like a slap in the face. A loving slap in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I love it, but I always feel gratified after a metaphorical slap in the face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, you d definitely didn't love it. I was I was actually taking a risk. I was rolling the dice on that because I figured it would either move you to the next level or you would never speak to me again. Mm -hmm. And it could have gone either way. Yeah. yeah. If I had not yeah. sat with it afterwards and, you know, really wrestled with my ego over it. Mm. But the maturation of your self nor is recognizing that Mushtaq did it out of love did did it to love you because to let you continue to that choice that you were all set to go ahead and not value yourself in that way nor your friend it's um recognizing those friends that actually have your best interest those teachers that have your best interest not because they want to keep you beholden as a teacher student, but it's it's something even higher than that. That's the love I'm talking about. I agree. <laughs> not not whether you're going to enjoy it. It's it's an awful, prickly, um, um, deeply uncomfortable. But it so sh can shift you and and disturbs your train of thought that you can make a change or not. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, yeah, that so was this is great. Yeah, that was a pivotal point for her because that was her entrance into human adulthood. She grew up mm. through dealing with that one experience. Yep, mm. and I'm glad we brought it up because things like that, you they become normalized into your life and you kind of forget mm. the significance of those pivotal moments. So this mm. conversation has been helpful for me in that way. Yeah. Mm -mm. Mm. Wonderful. I'm going to have to say my goodbyes. Yeah, I think we all have to do that because it's getting late. <laughs>
<laughs> we got things to do. TV to watch. Yeah. Well, thank you so right, much, Sheree. everyone. Yeah. yeah so take care. You all take care. We're waving goodbye at you. One second. Let me flip this over and give it a little bit of a gallery view so we can wave goodbye. Yeah. And, and yeah, uh, if anyone wants to ask me questions privately, you can always do that. And as Ms. Chuck said, I will answer or not answer, but either way, I will be honest and as forthcoming as I can be. Yep. All, All right. right. So good night, Bye. everybody.